Hi everyone, my name is Nono. I'm the CEO and founder of Mugilan. Uh, I'm glad to be here, it's an honor. Um, speaking English is not my native language, so please uh, uh, be patient if, I, if, I, if you don't understand, and please make questions if you don't understand. Uh, well, I'm a senior software engineer and been working on the industry since uh, well almost 10 years now. And most of it, most of all, I'm an electronic music lover and electronic music software enthusiast. I've been using electronic music software since the early 2000, and uh, I always wanted to merge my passion with music with my passion with technology. So you can understand a bit of my background. I worked in a company uh, called Bisswax after graduating myself at Minho University in Braga, Portugal. At this class, I had the honor and the pleasure to create two astonishing products within a small team. We have created a touch technology, a multi-touch technology, a large format multi-touch technology, which wasn't available at that time. We are speaking in 30 inches to 100 inches of uh, large format capacity touch technology. This was the time when the iPhone was just appearing, so that was a big boom. To do this, we had to make an electronic device bring and pull data from, from, from an hardware controller to the computer uh, through a USB uh, protocol, process the data on the computer, and uh, convert it into touch points uh, and deliver them to, to the OS. I think this was a great advantage at the time because uh, many of the devices that were in, 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 the, in the market by that time were doing this kind of processing inside the device. And 10 years ago, the, the, the device processing power is not the same. So basically, what you see here is um, a prototype of a large 1.2 diameter. Well, this is a scaled down version. We were doing a multi touch globe with 1.2 meters diameter, and you can see my hands on the globe and the touch being detected on, on the, the data captured on, on, on the electronic device. And the, the control panel is already being written in Qt. This was in 2009. I was in charge of doing the firmware, the driver, and the control panel development. I was really happy at this plaques, but I was also doing a lot of DJing and music producing. So I wanted to build my own Ableton Live controller. I was I started by by doing this for iOS, um, and I start to explore the the, the 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 APIs to to make this possible. And um, it was a personal challenge. I didn't want to buy a controller. I wanted to make a controller. I, I had to learn how to communicate with Ableton Live through the their API. I had to create the bridge so that I could find my device on the network and connect Wi-Fi uh, to, to the host computer and uh, exchange information between my device and Ableton Live. Uh, by that time, there were a few Ableton Live controls on the market, but, uh, and, and mine didn't add really nothing new. I was just challenging myself. But what, what started as a, a personal challenge soon became a product because iteration after iteration, I had user feedback, I had uh, user requests, and I wanted to reach more customers, so I had to constantly invest in digital marketing to get more customers. But on the Android, there was a lack of this kind of controls. So I decided to, to outsource the Android version 
and make it available for the Android market as well. So, in the beginning of 2012, I released the iOS version, and two years later, I released the Android version of Live Control, and it was a quite a success. Well, it was a time to give a step further and quit my uh, exciting job at this place and make my own company. This is a, a long time dream, but now I have a problem. I have to do all by myself for iOS and Android. So, how could I do this? How could I investigate and do new features and work on new products being one developer only? I, I knew the complexity of building interfaces and application development for iOS. I, I start to, to, to know about the Android platform because I had to take over the code that I, uh, that I needed to outsource. And when I started to make new features, I soon realized that it would be impossible to maintain this in a, a, a long term. So I had to find a, a better solution. And by that time, Qt4 Mobile was getting really stable and I decided to give it a try. So I decided to make a MTP product to control a really um, focused part well, you, I don't know how many of you know Tractor Software from Native Instruments, a uh, company I really respect a lot. Um, they have a Tractor Software which allows someone to, to DJ and you can apply effects to the music. Uh, I decided to make an app to control the, only the effects of Tractor Software. I was able to build TK effects. this was the first version, for Android, iOS, tablet, and phone with a single code base. I was really excited with this result, so now it was the time to move LK, Live Control to LK. Live Control was already a, a, a complex application because it had a lot of, of views, and especially what I call the matrix module, which is a module that replicates the Ableton Live Scene view, which can contain thousands of clips. It had to be really performant. So I had to implement this using scene graph. It took me a, a bit longer, but um, I also had to, to add new modules so that I could present something new. And six months later, after finishing TK effects, I've released LK in March 2015. Once again, I proved myself that it was possible to keep working with Qt for Mobile. So I decided once again to give a step further and work on something I wanted to build since the beginning of the company. For a long time, I, I wanted to build a synthesizer. But I didn't have all the, the knowledge for that, so I partnership with a friend, which is a, an electronic, analog electronic master and a synth enthusiast. So together we built the, the basic blocks of a synthesizer, and the rest is cute. But I had one more goal for this project. Besides supporting iOS, Android, tablet, and phone, I wanted to use the same code base for desktop as well. And that was precisely one of the biggest challenges of DRC. Because in the digital audio world, within a DAW, you, you can have third-party plugins that allows you to extend the functionality of the DAW. And they only provide you a pointer to a, a native pointer to a window, and then you need to put your your cute app running on that window. But there are a few problems that uh, that come from this: the deployment and the unicity of of the the app itself. So if there are 
if there isn't a custom namespace, if there are other software manufacturers using the same version of Qt, there could be a, a crash. So you need to compile Qt from the source and ensure that you are using a unique namespace. By that time, Qt company was, was um, promoting the startup license. I got the startup license and I started working on, uh, on, uh, on my own building of Qt from the source. By that time, Qt was not stable enough when building from the source, so I had a few problems, such as loading EML stuff into the window. I couldn't have the, the, um, the, the elements getting detected or recognized. I had to fill bugs. I had to <coughs> wait for some bugs to, to be solved. But in the end, uh, it all got, got sorted out at Qt 5.8. Today, DRC is quite a success. A success. It is considered by the, the, the Android synth users as the best synthesizer on Android. It was used by Google itself to showcase the Android low latency audio capabilities. And it is considered by the iOS <laughs> huge community as one of the best synthesizers on iOS as well. From mobile to desktop, DRC is Qt power. But Qt is also helping us to build media art installations. What you see here is our laser eye. It's a two meter high iron structure with eight laser pins that when you drop the laser beam, it will be sound. The sound is being generated by the same sound engine that is being used on DRC. And once again, to make this possible, I just had to use a Raspberry Pi, get Qt from the APT uh, repository, and make a few changes to just not include the UI stuff. Similarly, and more recently, we have made the digital music box. The digital music box is an old furniture that I transformed into a crank powered synthesizer. When you start to rotate the crank, you start to get the music being played and you can twist the knobs to, to change the sound of the, of the, of, of the sound that it's being generated well. Uh, this project is a bit more ambitious because uh, I used an Arduino to read all the knobs um, state and the crank rotational speed, and then I use Qt serial APIs to transmit that to the Raspberry using a custom protocol. I have documented this, this process of building this machine on YouTube. You should check it out because it's a funny and interesting process and result. Well, I can definitely say that Imaginan's future will be written with Qt. Because in the last three years, I've made something that I was never been able to do without Qt technology. The fact that I'm only using a single tool place for these three products makes Qt one hell of a choice to have uh, competitive time to market experience. Well, and when you program in C++, you are ensuring that you will have performance on all devices. There is one particular factor I love about Qt is that I don't need to test on devices every time. So most of my development time is made on the desktop, which is quick. To, to, to build and run. Because when I have to install and send to the device, in this case, for instance, Android, it takes a lot of time to send an application running on, on the Android. And when the application starts to build up in complexity, it, it gets even more time. So I, I, I spend minutes and minutes of my day debugging uh, 
waiting for the app to run on, on the device. So since most of the development can be done on the desktop, that saves me time. And time is money. And Qt Quick is also a great benefit because with Qt Quick, I'm really quick to make interfaces. I've been using iOS and Android and there is loads of boilerplate code that you simply don't need to write when you use Quick. Well, and most of all, the community. Cute community is awesome and I'm really proud to make part of it. Thank you. I'll be... Um, so my question is, we, we talked a lot um, about the engineering challenge of writing the software, but how was it like to get people to actually buy it? I mean, did you have to invest really into marketing, or did it somehow take off on, your, on its own? When you have something in the market, you have to constantly invest in promoting your product. Nothing appears from magically, you know? I, had, I, I when I started the company, and I had already one control you know, at me. And I just keep the step because I was I was making money with one control. When I started Imagine, that became the income for the company. At the moment, the company uh, uh, income was always based on users' support. Uh, and I always take a cut of my revenue to reinvest in digital marketing. Because otherwise, you don't have no chance, you know? I, I don't know if you have a five. No, no, no questions. What we have problem is there are thousands of devices. So we had problems that there are lots of many thousands of different devices with Android, and that there are bugs and crashes which we could not really uh, find out because of the vast majority, uh, vast number of different devices that we had. Yes, uh, there are problems every day. So in, in these last months, I've been able to, to have stable releases that, that doesn't give so many problems. But I always look at problems in, in, in a percentage base. If only 1% of your users is having problems, okay, accept it. You, you, cannot, you cannot solve everyone's problem. And unfortunately, uh, that's a reality. But there are test farms out there where you can have 1,000 devices to test your application, but they need the Android UI automation which is not possible with queue, so when you have just one activity. So that was a problem, and this is a problem I think us going native on the devices. I think that's a problem that goes behind, behind, uh, behind the huge scope. You know, for instance, Google Play has, has having a huge improvement in their developer console, uh, giving us tools to, to analyze uh, the, the crashes uh, by device, by a website, so uh, unfortunately Apple moves a little bit slower in, in that sense, uh, but this, these are, are more Android problems than iOS actually, because on iOS you are always, always on the edge. I was already familiar with Qt, uh, but I didn't add the, the, the trust on it, you know? So I started with TTFX, and then I, I moved, okay? And when I did two, the, those two apps, it totally convinced me, because the time I save, it's, it's, it's so important for me, alone, to manage everything else. Um, well, I surrendered myself to the technology, you know? Uh, with your mobile apps, how, how far back do you support older versions of the operating system? 
Well, for instance, on Android, I'm supporting until API 17, if I am not in a mistake, which is version 4.42. It's quite stable. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been only increasing the API uh, on Android because uh, I discovered that they have some built-in bonjour discovery, the end Yes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I, I pushed a bit for the API yeah, number. Uh, but yeah, uh, on iOS I, I'm supporting until uh, iOS 8. Any further questions? Otherwise, uh, uh, how difficult was it to have, uh, build and deploy your app for all the platforms? Was that no brainer, or was it difficult to just make sure that you get all of the platforms supported in your deployment? It, it gives you some work because uh, uh, you need to, especially in my in my case, because when you are dealing with uh, all new applications, uh, for instance in iOS, you, you, you need to support something that on Android don't, don't exist at all, for instance, interact audio. Uh, so I need to rely on, on other ways to make things work sometimes. For instance, the internet audio uh, or audio bus support allows you to move audio from your app to another app inside the, the, uh, the device itself. Um, so those kind of things are special to each platform. For instance, that doesn't come from Android, uh, but it's, it's, it's manageable. You, you, I, I use I use a, like a, a core controller and then I use J and I go back to that controller on the Android side to 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 talk with the Android specific stuff and I do the same for the iOS specific stuff. So you would say you didn't have to spend a lot of time <coughs> in the platform specific things. It didn't cost you a lot of time. For me, yeah. Uh, the, that will always consume some time. But for me, the, the, the time I save with Heal Quick and having only one single UI and not having to write custom and platform specific boilerplate to make things happen in the UI, it's simply awesome. So I, it's a good balance, you know? So if there are no further questions, then I would like to remind you to rate the presentations in the Cube World Summit app. And now there's a short coffee break and we continue at 4 o'clock. Thank you.